welcome to You Don't Know If You Don't Go. Today we're going to do some lake map planning and it's going to be in two parts. What I thought I would do is to introduce my associate, videographer Lauren Shumway. Say hi Lauren. Hey Randy. And have him pick out some spots based on his own science. In the second part, I would go over how to pick your spots on walleyes on an introductory level and uh, see what meshes, how we can compare them and how we can help people make uh, better presentation efforts for picking their spots and searching for walleye. So join us. We hope you enjoy the show. Hi Randy. What I wanted to do now is just talk a little bit about how I would approach Lake Minnetonka for walleye fishing. Minnetonka is an area where there's all kinds of potential areas for walleye. First thing is um, Walleye are not like bass, where they like to hang out in the weeds all the time. They seem to prefer some kinds of sandy bottom. So that allows us to start narrowing down the search a little bit. So what I would look for first are places where you have the weed bed rapidly dropping off into a sandy or, or gravel kind of bottom. And We'll take a look at the map and see what we can find in those areas. Thanks, Lauren. What we're going to do, folks, is uh, take a look at this lake map. And uh, Lauren's going to pick a bay, any bay he wants at random. It's Lake Minnetonka. And what we'll do is have him put some zeros down on five spots based on his science. This map comes with a very nice legend of bottom cover. So it shows vegetation, submerged vegetation, gravel, sand, rubble. So we want to look for areas where we're going to go from submergent vegetation to gravel with some kind of structure in terms of the overall um, a rapid drop into the other, other type of bottom. So what I wanted to look at was the lower lake, which is one of the larger sections of, of Lake Minnetonka. And if we look at it right away, we see a couple areas which which have that. So this area of Bracket Point, for example, we can see the submergent vegetation marked with the X. And we can also see that there's a very rapid drop off from 10 feet down to 50 ultimately, but with a fair amount of, of water in the, in the 20 to 30 foot kind of range. Another area with an awful lot of structure also has the drop-off and submergent vegetation and over here an area called Horseshoe Reef. So around Horseshoe Reef we have submergent vegetation here and then we have a real nice flat it's about 30 feet deep. So the fish can come from the, the flat come in and feed on the bait fish that's in the submergent vegetation and we can fish um, along the, the rapid drop-off. Another area that looks very interesting is this area called Diamond Reef. The Diamond Reef area is, is located here. It does have one problem, which is there's an awful lot of boat traffic in there, so it's not really good during the daytime hours. But as you can see in Diamond Reef, it comes all the way up to eight feet and then drops rapidly off to 51. And on the other side, it extends here. There's just all kinds of, of contours on the bottom, all kinds of of places where it rapidly gets shallow and then it goes deep but then this area here is not not extremely deep it's 50 feet on the average which is very much like Mill Axe. Mill Axe is about 40 feet deep for a good part of it. So this also looks like it'd be a very good area. Um, there's some vegetation around the sides but most of it has a kind of rocky or, or sandy bottom. There's one more area, Randy, that I know is very productive for walleye. It's kind of interesting because it's right near one of the most um, populated areas, the, the city of Wayzata. But right here in the Wayzata Bay, we see a very, very rapid drop off from five feet down to 50 feet, real close to the shoreline. And this also seems to be a very productive area for walleye. There's submergent vegetation right along the shore, but then with the drop off, you get drop off into a nice sandy, uh, or rocky bottom. Finally, there's one other area within the lower lake that uh, 
looks like it should be productive for walleye and that's over near Grandview Point or Carson's Bay. As we can see it drops off to, to 61 feet. It's a very rapid drop off. The water, there's a fair amount of water flow due to the nature of the channel here. Um, so there's a lot of under, underlying structure, a lot of possible current for the bait fish to be caught up in. And this would look like a very productive area as well for walleye around here. Thanks, Lauren. There's a couple things you need to think about walleyes. Walleyes love deep water. They love gravel, they love weeds, they eat all the time just like kids. They love transitions, they love breaks, they love points, they love nooks, they love crannies. So when you think about finding them, you want to be where they are when they're feeding. That's the whole point. Get on a pot of them the right time of day when they're feeding and bang, it's just walleye heaven. Walleye spawn in the spring and migrate to shallow, rocky, moving water to do so. Remember that. If your lake has water running into it or out of it from a creek, river, tributary, something like that, the nearest place that they have rocky, moving water to spawn in is where they'll go in the springtime. And it's real easy, real easy to get them there, but it's against the law in Minnesota. Okay? People fished walleyes during the spawn, there wouldn't be anything left to go deeper in the lake. After the immediate post-spawn, the females will rest for a week, maybe three days to a week in, in pre-post-spawn habitat. And the bite is good, the feed bag goes on because after they have rested, they start feeding. What you'll find is that the males and the females will feed in the post-spawn. It'll be the strongest bite of the year in the early season habitat, pre-summer, right around 50 degrees of water temperature, surface temperature. That's another key item to remember, 50 degrees of water temperature. That's when it'll turn on, somewhere around that, that time. Another thing to think about is fishing them at the thermopline. 50 degrees is right around thermocline weather, and wherever you can find that 50 degree water shallow where the, the rocks, the transitions, and the points, and the breaks, and the drops are near to deep water, that's where you'll find them. The first item to remember after the spawn, deep water. Where shallow water and deep water match up, it's a good chance you'll find some walleyes there will spawn. So Randy, I noticed you're smoking a lot of cigars here. That helps you with the fishing? Yeah, you know, for me, uh, when, when the fishing's a little slow, I light one of these dudes up and uh, everything's better. But for some reason, the fishing gets better too. What I'm going to do is to uh, give you some mnemonics that will help plan your fishing approach to the lake. There's a lot of different things that can go into it, which are in the book, the first book, Walleye. But there's three letters that you need to think about, and this one comes from the In Fisherman guy, so thank him for this because it's really good. It's called ASH. A-S-H. Area, structure, and habitat. Those are the three symbols or three mnemonics that you use to search for walleyes. The first one being the area of the lake that you search. The second one being a finer search in the structure patterns. And the final search being the habitat where you find them or where you think they'll be. Area, structure, and habitat. Remember that. Once you have area, structure, and habitat in your mind, and again, thank the people at InFisherman because it's a really good one. Once you have it, you can break up your walleye search by season. There's a spawning season, there's post-spawn, there's early summer, the summer doldrums, when the water cools off, later, fall bite, then you have a late fall bite, pre-ice, ice up, ice out. That's pretty much the whole year. So they'll do different things based on water temperature. And they'll be in different areas of the lake based on the season. That's where you get into area. Structure follows area, habitat will follow the structure. Another thing you can think about, folks, planning for your walleye trip is wind direction 
plankton planning, and meteorology. These are some more theoretical items that you can add on a static basis to give yourself the best chance to find a, a feeding pod. The wind pushes the waves and the waves push the plankton and their small microbes and stuff like that. So whichever way the wind is blowing, it's going to push them in towards shore. And you know, if the wind's coming from the east, the east side of your reefs and your breaks and stuff is where you should probably look first. Everything has its natural place within the food chain. Without plankton, it has to start somewhere, so that's what it is. Wind drives the plankton, and where that goes, the minnows will go. Where the minnows will go, the fry and the yearlings will go. And where they go, the larger game fish will go, and it just keeps going up till it comes to the toughest predator, you and I. Lauren has got some pretty good spots lined out here, and he has them lined out in regards to area of the lake. There's some a lot of water here to cover that he's got lined up, and he's got uh, one, two, three, he's got five spots picked out for you. So what I thought I would do is talk about structure look and then a search for habitat within these spots. Uh, the first one was Brackets Point, and if you'll notice here, Brackets Point is very shallow with weeds and rocks and a point. Okay area of the lake, structure, structure of the lake, habitat, okay, a very good spot, habitat, this whole area, another good spot, Diamond Reef, Lauren made an excellent pick because the top of Diamond Reef here, it's rocks, it drops off fast, there's deep water nearby. So the shallow water ecosystem here is going to provide food. The deep water here is going to provide cooler water when it gets hotter. Fish will draw to this because of those factors. When it gets hot, they can go deep. When they want to feed, even though the water is warmer, the food source, boom, they come shallow, they eat, they go back deep. Okay. Area of the lake is lower lake. Structure is the reef that's in two parts and it's about 600 yards long. Habitat, somewhere in there, somewhere in there, and on the point. There's that word again, point. Little Horseshoe Reef has got 62 feet of water, not very far from it, on this side. It's got 80 feet of water here, 62 and 80. It's got 66 feet over here, deep water. Okay? Area of the lake is off the lookout. Structure is going to be this broken up section in here, which comes out. There looks like rocks in here, and there's a reef that runs this way. Okay? That's the structure. The habitat will be something very small along these places. Area, structure, and habitat. There's your search. Another place, Wyzetta Bay. Excellent place, got a lot of walleyes out of there. Area of the lake, Wyzetta Bay. Structure, there's rocks in there. It's shallow, that means there's weeds, that means there's food. It's connected to deep water. It's 30 something feet, just feet from shore. Area, structure, and habitat. Now because of the boat pressure, they move around a lot and they get beat up by props. But area, structure, and habitat, and a seasonal search will help you find them on any lake. Okay. The fifth one, Grandview Point, Carson's Bay, another good pick, why? deep water, not very far from Grandview, it drops to 60 feet. Well folks, that's the show. Being able to find fish will help you put fish in the boat. And that's what this was designed to do. To help you have some science, to help you find some fish, and to bring home some success. Join us next time on You Don't Know If You Don't Go.